Hello and welcome back to another episode of Fully Booked, the Hidden Gems author podcast in which Craig Touch, myself, Roland Hume, and chat to some of the interesting figures and leading lights of this crazy industry of writing and self-publishing. And today I am delighted to welcome a very special guest who is going to get inside our heads and yours, Caroline Dunford, a novelist, lecturer and psychologist. Caroline, how are you doing today? Welcome to the show. Um, yes, how are you doing? Oh, well, thank you for having me. I'm doing fine. It's a, it's a good day. It's even sunny here. Cold, but sunny. Scotland. Ah, uh, absolutely. That happens a lot. Last time I was I was in Britain at all, my son arrived for the first time and he was like, Dad, it really does rain every day here. Oh, all four <laughs> seasons in one day. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us, Caroline. Of course, we wouldn't be here without the man himself, Craig Touch, the owner and founder of Hidden Gems and an author himself. How are you doing today, Craig? I'm doing really well. Thanks, Roland. And thanks, Caroline, for joining with us today. I, I'm excited about this because I, um, when I went to university many, many years ago, I, uh, you know, I originally went to, uh, for the writing program, but then I wasn't, I wasn't a big fan of the program that uh, they had there. So I switched and I switched to psychology. I became a psychology major and that's what I got my degree in. Um, and then, you know, there was a long and winding road that led me to writing, back to writing. But, uh, you know, at the time I thought I would probably go forward, become a psychologist, well, you know, psychiatrist. I, you know, I, I just didn't, <laughs> but I really enjoyed the psychology. And I think that the, um, you know, what I learned really helps me understand people and helps mm. me write characters uh, in a more authentic way. So I'm, I, and you're a forensic psychologist. So I think that that is, uh, you know, for me, it's a pretty exciting topic. So that's what we are focusing on today is the idea of, you know, this uh, psychology and how authors can use it to, yeah. um, to explain their characters. So why don't you tell us a bit about yourself and your writing and your, your psychology background and let's go from there. Well, I started out doing something entirely different at university. I started out doing um, English literature and uh, I wanted to be a psychologist, but I became a journalist instead um, <laughs> after I finished. And then I went back to psychology and I trained as a, a psychotherapist. And it was around that time that I was, I'd been writing from when I was very young and I carried on writing and writing for me was always about making sense of the world. I mean, that's how I process my own experiences. And it's also how I understand other people even though I don't necessarily write about other people and spending the time in psychotherapy where I was dealing with people from all walks of life. Um, and I did what we call, um, among other things, uh, frontline service, which means somebody can just walk in off the street. They haven't got a recommendation. They might have just walked out of um, a hospital and they're coming straight to you. So huge range of experiences. And while I couldn't ever use any of those people or their stories, it exposed me to a wider range of human behavior um, than I would otherwise have come across. And after that, I carried on writing. I got my first, I've, I've been publishing short stories for ages, and I'm just trying to write a short story at the moment, and I've forgotten how to do it because I started publishing uh, longer works in about 2001. Um, and I have always been interested in outsiders, people who are different, and I've always been interested in puzzles as well. So, Going into, I started off Murder Mistress, but within um, uh, the Euphemia Martin's books, but within a very short space of time, I discovered that everybody liked one character who was meant to be a walk-on character more than the others. And his name was Fitzroy, and he was an agent of the Crown. And if you know anything about World War I, which is when these books are set just before and just into World War I, the espionage um, kind of secret service in Britain at that time was a bit crazy. Um, not very well organized and people doing very ridiculous things. So I wrote that for a while. Um, everybody seemed to like it reasonably well. It's in the 17th book now. And then I started writing about one of the main characters, who's Euphemia Martin's daughters in um, the uh, Hope books, which is the Hope Stapleford Mistress. And those are slightly longer books and they're generally set in um, World War II. And they're sort of when um, the whole idea of espionage and deceit and manipulating people has become more subtle and more organized and less sort of um, wild card. So right. I've written other books as well, and I've written young adult books, and I, I try to look at things that like young adult books. I wrote um, a book about uh, fake news, looking at um, what's real in the real world and how, how kids deal with um, the reality. And I wrote a young adult book about... Um, 
uh, ch children grooming other children for crime, called, um, which is called Snared. Um, and it's full of swear words. I really had to have help from my teenagers <laughs> to do that. So, wow. um, and I write a bit of fantasy, but it's all about um, the people and forensic psychology. I studied, a, I did a master's recently um, alongside everything else and discovered how very, very much I loved it. And I hope, I don't know if I, I, I'm going to get in yet, but I hope to go on and do a PhD, which will be looking at elements of terrorism and how people become extremists and how to stop them being extremists, how to prevent it if possible. I think that's a really interesting thing when you come to forensic psychology. There is always a point of intervention. Um, right. And we don't Ooh, do that's... enough intervention, I don't think. Yeah. That's fascinating. Stop yeah. now. <laughs> <That's a> big... <laughs> well, I mean, there's so much in there. Like, I mean, when you write crime and mystery novels, I think that that specifically is really um, having a forensic psychology background mm. is probably really helpful, right? Because you're it's the crime and that element of of why they're doing and trying to get inside their minds uh, to, to figure out the solution to the crime, and that must uh, make writing that sort of a novel easier, I think. Well, easier in that you kind of know the background work that you should do, but maybe you do more work. Um, well, yeah, reason, yeah. Yep, the it'll be better, love, though. It'll be more authentic, I think, right? Yeah, that's exactly what I tried to do. And the reason I even started down the road of crime, apart from the fact I like reading it, is that when you put people in a war or, or, or well, one of the world wars or a crime zone or something like that, you put them in this crucible of pressure and all the kind of veneers of civilization fall away and you start seeing who people really are and it's the contrast between who people pretend to be and who people really are and who people think they are and then who they actually are when it's revealed to themselves I mean not everybody's pretending but not everybody knows themselves as well as they might and yes um, when you have somebody who is a villain um, and has committed a murder or done something terrible it is much more interesting if there is a reason why they cross the lines now that doesn't mean that you are excusing what they do you're not condoning it in any way um i wrote a play a few years ago about burke and Hare, and it was looking at not all the murders they did but why they ended up doing what they did and charting their passage down into becoming serial killers um through the circumstances that channeled them down that way that doesn't mean to say people don't have choices along the way i mean and that's part of the not condoning it's being aware that you have choices but sometimes you look at things and you think what else were they going to do so right. I've, I've i always find it interesting that in comics because i've got kids and they read comics the marvel comics it's all about the heroes but the dc comics it's always about the villains like mm. the joker and two-face and stuff because had the story of why they became villains suddenly like opens them up to be sympathetic not necessarily sympathetic as in yeah. allowing them to get away with what they do but you can understand to a certain extent why they do it and that's what makes them so fascinating and so compelling yeah we, we love bad guys everybody loves mm. a bad guy i mean an anti-hero who actually has a saving grace is is i think the most favorite one in the idea that people all people are fallible um I think resonates with everyone, though so hopefully most of us don't commit murder in our spare time. But um, yes, it's, it, it, and you know, somebody who's just a good guy, I mean, that's the other thing. I mean, the heroes um, that are good through and through, oh God, they're dull. I mean, would you really want to go and sit in a coffee shop and talk to somebody who had these great powers and was just good through and through? It made me feel a bit sick after a while, I would think. Well, that's I think that's one of the big, big uh, differences between DC and Marvel and why uh, I think Marvel is sort of more popular because DC is known for creating these like super powered heroes that are almost flawless and indestructible mm -hmm. and, and not a ton of their of their backstory. Whereas Marvel is, is they always create these flawed, <laughs> excuse me, all these flawed uh, heroes and uh they're easier to relate to and they and they're not overpowered right they have their vulnerabilities and i think that that makes them more re relatable than you know superman who is just you know you always have to keep coming up with a stronger and stronger villain yeah. <laughs> to, to be able to beat them yeah and it, it gets kind of crazy doesn't it it gets too far removed from human experience right. um i i think that if you were 
if you could be a superhero, for example, if you were a good guy and you were a good guy superhero, that must put an awful lot of pressure on you. I always liked the fact that Hawkeye had lots of trouble um, sort of maintaining his, his family life and his hero life, for example. Um, and it, it, it wouldn't be easy, would it, to be a great person in other people's eyes? It never has been. And when we have heroes in history or whatever, when you go back and you look at what's behind them and what they actually endured, it's a lot bigger than the little bit that you see. Uh, the more complex, the more interesting, the more valuable, the, um, the more interesting. And the more ways they can be defeated. I mean, when I'm, I'm teaching writing um, to students, I'm always saying, please build in vulnerability, build in needs, build in, um, nobody exists on their own. We all connect somehow, and that can be a positive thing and a negative thing. That's, I find it's fascinating, your spy master Fitzroy series being in World War One, because as you said, that that was a real crucible and for, it's not for the human his... character. It's 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 Euphemia Martin series. He just came along, and everybody loves him. He's 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 a, he's a he's really bad good guy, and that's what everybody likes because he does the things that need to be done for the right reasons. Um, and he's a bit of a yeah, he's a bit of a wild card. And yes, the um, the espionage stuff around World War One was crazy. World War One itself, I don't go into the trenches, but that's very obliquely referred to. I mean, that's been done very well by lots of people, and that is just awful. So I was interested in all the pieces that got moved around before war began. And my spies tend to feel that their job, um, whether or not real spies would feel this, I don't know, but um, in the time, but my spies tend to feel that their job is to prevent war from happening. And once it's happening, to bring it to as quick a conclusion as possible. So, yeah. And it makes sense. I mean, you you know, it's like the butterfly effect. You one little change can yeah. cause a huge thing and, and or stop a huge thing, stop a war, right? You know, if you trace wars back to their origin stories, then you often would find there was some critical decision that was made at some point. And if somebody had made a different decision, if somebody had pushed them in a different direction, maybe that war wouldn't have started. Maybe those decisions that led to it wouldn't have been made or or they would have led to different decisions, right? So, yeah, I think every spy that's in the trenches is probably, probably were plenty of wars that were averted because of things that's, that spies have done that we don't even know about. I, and I love digging up those stories as well. A lot of the things that we don't hear about. Um, in one of the books, um, there was, uh, and it, it, this is a, perfectly true, because they in World War One they were using the dreadnoughts, and because the German Navy was amassing on the other side, and they were thinking, how are we going to get our dreadnoughts from the west coast of Scotland, where we were being built, across the other side of the country? You either go through the Minch, which is at the top, which is really awful, see where, or you go all the way around the bottom, which takes forever. So somebody had the bright idea, as they would just extend um, the fort in the middle of Scotland and cut it in two. And there was this big meeting um, about cutting Scotland in two to take the dreadnoughts through. And something happened. And it never happened. But that was an mm. actual thing that they were considering. So, of course, I take that and I give them all a whole reason as to why it didn't happen, why it never goes ahead. And my characters are all involved. But in reality, we don't actually know why. But it was a thing. They were going to cut Scotland in half. Uh, wow. I, I know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the so that's the thing about um you know psychology and and you know getting into sort of mm. the minds of of the what makes people tick what makes them make those decisions Absolutely. and it's never and it's never like um done in a vacuum right it's always mm. uh, all these things that led up to them and that's what psychology is is sort of like examining what it is that turned a person into the person that they are built the personality that they have and it's often due to things that happened to them in the past experiences they had people that were in their life and influential people parents you know um and it, you know i find it gives you empathy even if you're you know even if you're not empathetic to a person you at least understand like you were saying before it doesn't mean that you you um you excuse their behavior but mm. you understand it and to be an author you have to be able to see both sides 
and and right both sides, even when you don't agree with them because you, you need a villain. It doesn't mean you you condone murder because you're right about murders, mm. but you have to understand them. So I think that's yes. one of the yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Um, it, it is one of the, the, the fascinating things. And I do sometimes let my murderers get away. <laughs> I, <laughs> I mean, that happens in real life plenty of times, exactly. probably more often than, than not. Uh, um, and, and I think it's also, as you say, it's what leads somebody to do something. And a really simple example, somebody who wants to... Um, he wants to conduct a campaign that can uh, that that will take over a lot of the world. Wants to be in control of everything. Usually, the flip side of that is a terrible insecurity, and a fear of lack of control, and that that's been a, a, a quite often a a theme throughout their life. And through chance or through determination, they have accrued more and more power and more and more attempts to control, and they just want to keep going. Um, they can't. Yeah. I love that. It's funny. You had some of the most controlling people in the world are the ones who are most insecure and yeah. the things in their own life they can't control. They try and exert through control of other people. There's psychology. Oh, <laughs> but how, how do you go about putting using psychology in the stories you create? And does the psychology drive the plot or does the, the plot have to get explained by psychology? I think the characters drive the plot. And the characters have to be three dimensional for me. So therefore they have to have reasons why they do what they do. Um, a lighthearted one, right? Um, Fitzroy is something of um, a playboy, to put it mildly. And eventually it's revealed in his backstory that um, he got married very young when he first became a secret agent and his wife got murdered when he was out of the country by somebody who was trying to get their own back on him, but who he never actually managed to trace. And he decides after that that he can never risk anyone else. He can't have a family, um, which wasn't actually what they did. Actually, I always found that quite fascinating that um, spies from World War One and early parts of World War Two often did have families and were often quite open about who they were. But for him, he becomes almost this uh, uh, Casanova type character because he he really likes women, but he's not going to get any put anyone in danger. But it takes you a while to realise why he's such a naughty boy. <laughs> And how do you go about explaining that? Because one of the things, the story is obviously you want to have a rollicking story, but when you've yeah. got to explore the backstory, do you do it through flash book backs? Um, what's what's your technique for managing to explain the backstory of a of a customer with oh, it's not customer, sorry, of a character without um, interfering with the flow of the story? Well, usually it wraps at some point. Like I. Um... Euphemia's father was a translator at a, um, a, I'm trying to remember exactly historically when it was, because I'm not a historian, I just have to go and find the history, um, uh, was a translator at a very important point before World War I, and he got on the wrong side of somebody, and actually the book starts with her father dying in a dish of liver and onions, and who is, he's a vicar, and that they need to uh, find somewhere to, some way to bring in income, and she become, goes into service which is incidentally based, based on my great grandmother, but that's, that's, that's another story. Um, and what they don't know and what I knew right from the start was that he'd been poisoned. And that doesn't come out until book 11. So oh. I, and I've just spoiled it for some, well, it doesn't really spoil it, but it, it changes why she got pulled into the world of espionage and everything, because she was being watched, because people felt responsible for what had happened to her father, but she had no idea. Um, and so I, I, you know, the, the saying that they have in the film world about um, start late, leave early when it comes yes. to a story. So for me, I'm creating all these backgrounds and I'm seeding things. And OK, yes, some of it does come organically as you're going on. But I know why people are doing things all the way through. Oh, dear. Does that make me sound like a control freak? Like uh, moving <laughs> well, all these I people already. Think... I think as writers, we are automatically not necessarily control freaks in the external world, but in art, yeah. you know, we write to make sense of the ridiculousness of the world. I mean, you yes, look at what's absolutely. going on in the middle of the East and it oh, would make you just yeah. want to set the world ablaze. But when you absolutely. write about it, you can you can create a world in which it explains why people do terrible things. And also um, one of the things I love yes. doing is asking awkward questions in mm. sort of like, 
so that people come away and think, would I have actually killed this person if I'd had the opportunity to get away with it because what they were doing was so terrible or would I not? Or questions along those lines that I don't give any answers. I mean, no, that's that's not my job, but I, I, I do agree with you absolutely that part of what we're doing is holding up a mirror to the world and how the world is behaving and people are doing these crazy things and looking at some of the psychology, some of the things that are about fear, um, some of the things that um, are about, well, othering is a huge thing at the moment in the world. We're not looking at ourselves as a global race of human beings. We're looking at ourselves as all kinds of different pockets. Um, and, yeah. and 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 the other thing, um, uh, we, we just had a budget in, in, in Britain and without going into any deep politics, let's just say that the budget prioritised how much money you could put in your pocket rather than the availability of services like education or health or something like that. And yes, everyone needs money to survive and everyone has a right to, uh, I think a right to, um, like, well, uh, who says it doesn't, and, and the UN, everyone has a right to shelter whether they get it or not. And they have a right to food and everything like that. Um, but there is an awful lot of things within all our societies that prioritize money and things and you can't take them with you. Um, Absolutely they, not. Yeah, and, and it's, I think the new generation that's coming up, I've got, I've got two kids, um, uh, 16 and 22. Are that still kids? Two kids. And I think their generation is prioritizing experience over things. And I see that as a real hope for the future. Um, Absolutely. Hmm. Definitely. Yeah. I, I mean, I love, I love the idea that you said of othering. I've never actually even heard that term, but I always talk about that with people in my life is that that's, that's frustrates me the most is that yeah. it, exactly what you said, like we're all just people stop breaking us into groups mm. and saying, why am I different than that person? Why don't we just say we are all people like, what could we, as a human race have accomplished if we all work together instead of find different ways to fracture all the time about every topic often i think the only thing that would ever bring the human race together is if aliens came to attack us <laughs> yes. then, oh. because then they're the others right? absolutely there is nothing like uniting any group of people than to give them an enemy and particularly right. an em enemy that they will be scared of that draws people together more like than anything. And people abuse that all the time. They create enemies um, yeah. for people to to respond to. Um, and Look at the 1930s yeah. and look at what's going on right now. Yes. Um, and I think that's where writing comes in and story comes in because we know that the more people read, the more empathic they can become. Because every time you read a book, you enter into somebody else's mind. Now, I could be trying to show you that somebody is angry because they're scared or very simply, or I could be showing you that somebody desperately wants something or to achieve something because they have never had any recognition in their life or, or you know, things that have become important to them that seem meaningless to us, having assumed um, a really important meaning to them because it's a way they deal with pain or, or some kind of pain in their life. But every time you're reading my stories, you're reading not only my mind is a form of telepathy, but you're reading about how I see other people and how I try to put myself into the minds of other people. And that's what we're doing with psychology. I mean, as you say, Craig, what we're trying to do is to understand someone else. And I'm sure you've heard the, the, the phrase there, but for the grace of God go I. Sort of, could you have not gone to that place if you were there? If you under their, under their circumstances, can you create an empathy so that in the real world, you can find a diplomatic way out of something. Um, in a story, it might be how you can defeat a villain, how you can find out who they're going to go after next, or how you can unpick a piece of information. Um, but yeah. yeah, story, so important. We are nothing but collections of stories. What is yeah, it Hemingway I mean, wrote about a good story is truer than what actually happened? Yeah. Oh yeah, sometimes you'll see a true story and you'll think if I wrote that, people just wouldn't believe it. They'd think that oh, yeah. there's no way, there's no way that would really happen, right? So, so truth is stranger than fiction. Um I you know, I, I think that 
a lot of times people almost have to be well it depends on the pe and the people especially and probably more children but there's probably a lot of adults where they have to almost be hit over the head with um something to really understand how someone else feels like they, it has to be more obvious like I, I think about my own children and sometimes they'll have issues with other kids in their class or, or whatever mm. it is and I'll say to them you know well why do you think they're doing that like there's probably a reason like what did I'm not to blame them but like what did you do before that happened like oh I'm sure they didn't just walk up to you and hit you or walk up to you and 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 say that mean thing what did you do that maybe led up to that or you know there might have been some or or what was happening at the time or what you know there's always mm. there's people don't act in a vacuum usually no I, and I, I that's what they have to get and that's what i think readers have to understand that's what ha writers have to understand and why we don't want those one-dimensional characters and those those uh villains that are just evil for the sake of being evil there's reasons and and by understanding those reasons that's how we get the, that empathy yeah i remember my younger son coming home from primary school and yet the my poor children are indoctrinated in all forms of psychology when i'm reading i talk to them all the time <laughs> from when they were really right. small they they can't get away but he came home and he said that this boy had been really horrible and he hadn't done anything and he said you know i think it's because his parents are splitting up and he's just so angry and upset and i thought yes well done you've got that but that's the thing it, sometimes stuff happens it's nothing to do with you at all right and yeah. more often than not in interactions a lot of it isn't that much to do with the person if it's one-to-one -one interaction it's often just what's going on in somebody else's head um, and mm -hmm. we tend to think about it as us the interesting thing you said about understanding others is i'm sure you remember this from your days as a psychologist there was um psychologist called uh, a woman called mead who introduced the idea of the generalized other well it's probably been refined a thousand times over now um but the idea is you can only really understand what it's like to be in somebody else's um, shoes when you're about 12. and the reason you see this is that's when kids become really good at playing team games because they can start to predict what other people are doing it's not that they can't work on it before then but that's the time when it really comes together and the interesting thing from the time that I studied it was um, we talked about this, they get to this age 12 of understanding of empathy and some people don't go any further. And some people do. And I think reading helps with that. Sometimes it's frightening to think that other people are scared too. Sometimes people want to look out on the world and think there is somebody in charge, there is somebody that knows what they're doing. The idea that uh, you know, as a kid, you think, oh, adults know what you're doing. You know, as you become an adult, you think, oh, that was a bit of a wind up, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's like I'm not 46. I'm 18 with 28 years experience. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You, you feel I remember my father when he was quite old saying, um, I'm 16 until I run for a bus in my head. Yeah. And I thought, you know, <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> as I've gotten older and older in my head, I, I'm still, I don't feel 50, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and I, and then that actually makes me sometimes sad when I think about, you know, like my grandparents and, yes. and stuff, and, you know, especially when they became really frail and, and, and I'm thinking to myself in their heads though, were they, did they still feel like they were 18? Like it was, it, it oh. must be such a terrible thing to, to have that i mean it is for me already with the aches and the pains and i think oh I, i'd love to be able to do this i could have done this in my youth why can't i still do it you know but when you get older and older that must be even worse i tried re i try that really hard to reflect that in in the things that i write because for me yes the person inside is the person who did all those amazing things when they were younger there was a wonderful series of photographs and i'm afraid i can't remember the photographer's name where they had things like a very old woman looking out of a window of a train and on the other side you saw her as a young nurse who she used to be um people who uh, you know who've been incredibly brave done amazing things and are now very old and it's only as we it's it, it's kind of like a i don't know what you call it a confidence trick it's only as we go old, grow older that we understand what's going on inside and the, the strengths and the ideas that we had as a young person, we can still carry forward and maybe we can still use to a certain extent, but yeah, don't get it when you're young. And um, they say youth is wasted on the young. I don't think yeah. it is. I think youth is just 
a time when you can be vibrant and alive. And the trick is to try and continue to be vibrant and alive. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's like as you get older, you think about all the things you should have done when you were young, right? And you you didn't have the knowledge you have now that you mm. could have you could have done all those things and 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 then you try to tell your children to do those things and they're like no nah, i don't want to do those things <laughs> and then you're like but but you don't understand you will you'll regret it later you know oh uh, well uh, the word should is a terrible word well <laughs> because okay. it means somebody else is telling you that well exactly which yeah, it's is coming why. from your like, background or whatever yeah if i say something they obviously won't do it but when their friends say the exact same thing and this happened to me like yesterday with my son <laughs> and then he goes and does it i'm like huh that's weird because i have been telling him to do that forever <laughs> you and know? I, I say to my kids you can do anything you want i don't care what you want to do you can do anything you want as long as you're happy and you know you're not hurting anyone else um right. and they're all sort of like oh i don't know what to do and i'm sort of like, <laughs> yeah. you right. know whereas exactly. i was told you can do this this or this <laughs> well, it's, it's more that I, you know, I, I have things that I think that they would enjoy, but yeah. a lot of times they won't even try them because I'm suggesting it, you know? Yeah, <laughs> me too. That's, that's the frustrating thing. That's just parent so, 101. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, Greg. So uh, one of the things I'm wondering is when you, like, as authors, we don't want to sort of uh, be so explicit in how, mm. what we say and, 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 and um, expository and all that stuff yeah so i'm thinking like when you're trying to add sort of this the psychology of, of why somebody mm -hmm. does something to a book and really give them that background to explain it how much um can you rely on the reader to understand that that that, that those motivations have created that um that yeah character trait you know without saying to them oh he did that because he was beaten as a child like you show him being beaten and then later he's a bad person and you hope that the person that the reader understands that connection absolutely that, i mean that's a big part of what you do is that you, obviously you're, you're you're showing rather than telling as you know basic basic thing we, we say all the time but it, it is about um building up a picture of characters and thinking about for me what were the significant moments in somebody's life that led them to be the person that they are and then seeing how many of those we can show um during the story or maybe but that's the beauty of a series you can show it over um maybe a few books and some of my readers will really pick up on it and love that and other readers just want to know um who's the murderer and i think you have to except that people read books at different levels for different things. I never underestimate the intelligence of my readers, but I do think they look for different things. Um, in my, you know, they call my books cozy crime sometimes, and it's sort of like, well, well there's war, there's disaster. I mean, cozy crime sounds like you get somebody, you put a duvet around them, give them a cup of tea and say, terribly sorry, I'm going to kill you now. Cozy crime. Nothing, nothing but, cozier than 1914, <laughs> right? Um, but I think what it is about in Cozy Crime is that there is a recognition that at least most of the good people will be there at the end of the day. It's not quite that all the toys at the end of the day go back into the into the toy chest, but it is that there is hope. It's not dystopian. It's there are good people working to make the world a better place. Um, and that is something I think we really need to put into stories at the moment because we hear about all the bad things. And there are good people doing things we recently in britain we celebrated um the royal um national lifeboat association and these are people who go out onto the sea rescue people whenever the weather is bad they might be doctors dentists teachers shopkeepers whatever they don't get paid for it they do it because they can and is a reminder that there is that goodness in people and i think when you write darker stories that's what you're trying to show as well not just how people become bad but how even in the worst of times, there can be um, an essential light within humanity. And we really need to believe that now. <laughs> we do. I mean, one of the problems I think we have in society is there are people who we've traditionally thought of as heroes. And then you can look into, if you're super sensitive when you look into their lives, uh, yeah. you can find things to suddenly say, oh, this person was a terrible. Uh, this person, when they were 12 years old, tweeted something that was repellent. Mm -hmm. And it yeah. was a repellent tweet, but they were 12 years old and maybe they didn't fully understand what they were saying. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it, it is about uh, understanding that um, one action does not necessarily negate another, I guess. No. So, but that's and that people, people can get better. People can become, you could, there's um, 
again, Craig, you'll know this. Um, uh, Rogers, who, who, who used to, it was, uh, he, he really, his psychology came out of um, the Korean War and it was very sort of Buddhist in approach, but you couldn't say that because everybody was scared of people from the left. But he said, in some ways, people are like potatoes. Wherever you put a potato, when it sprouts, it'll move towards the light. So he had a fundamental belief that no matter where you started, you tried to become a better person. You tried to become better than you are. And so I suppose in psychology, what we do is we plant people in, uh, well, in, in writing, not in psychology, you plant people in various places and they move towards the light. So there is something within everybody, but some people, maybe less so. I yeah, like and I think, that. Yeah, and I think a lot of writing, you know, we, we've talked a lot about story structure recently. And um, one of the main sort of tenets of that is that the character changes over the course mm, of the book. Absolutely. You know? yeah. yeah. And so you have to, it, so you yeah, can't just have a character that's one way at the beginning and another at the end without no. sort of taking them through the path of, of that change. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. And a lot of that is the psychology of it, what's changing in what's happening in their lives that's causing them to, to change as a person. If I go back to something I was talking about earlier, my character Fitzroy, first wife murdered, he does fall in love. And because he falls in love, he makes sure that that person marries somebody else and keeps them safe. And then eventually, when that person dies, he gets to marry the person he's been in love with for a long time. Oh. So, I I find I I pro, uh, write romance novels, and I find it so interesting with psychology and romance. Novels. I think every single man should read romance novels because it's it. I think it's so interesting to see what it is, well, you know, how women think or what mm. appeals to women. And I think that's so fascinating with the stories because the character, the 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 male leads in in romance books are so much more exciting and interesting, colourful than the male leads in in male written books. I mean, mm. in that. In a, a man's fantasy story, you'd have the the young penniless farm boy who picks up the sword and rescues the damsel from the the cruel and lustful evil king. Whereas in a woman's romance novel, the woman stays with the cruel and lustful king, who actually turns out to have a heart of gold or something like that. I yeah. find it we don't necessarily want to be rescued. I mean, rescuing is disempowering of somebody. Absolutely. Yeah, um, I agree. And the one thing that I do, I think all my books have romance in them. They always have relationships and love that's there, whether it works out or not, because I think that, you know, again, psychology is a fundamental part of the human condition that we need others. And we deal with that however we deal with it. Um, but <laughs> I tried writing romances. I just kept killing people in it. I can't <laughs> get away with that. Um, I wonder too, like, so one of the things that I found I enjoyed writing uh, when I was writing romance was writing in that, you know, shifting third person, uh, first person perspective where, you know, one one chapter is, is seen from the eyes of this person mm -hmm. and the next chapter is from that person because that allows you to, you know, in the chapter where it's about, say, the female, she's doing things and then the man is, is doing something that, you know, she doesn't like, let's say, and then you when you switch to his, you see why he did that and it sort of like gets into his head more right um and maybe that's an easier way to write because i don't have to uh i don't have to i guess give as many clues for the author mm. for the readers to figure it out uh without you know before i jump into the person's head and just sort of like be like yeah he did that you know for whatever reason right so i wonder when you're writing are you writing, what perspective do you tend to go in and, and serve like a reason in terms of, of being able to put uh, that sort of background in easier? I imagine if you're, especially if you're talking a lot about the the uh, <clears throat> the, the childhood of, of, a, of a person, unless you're going to have flashbacks all the time, you kind of need to be in their head. So maybe they're thinking about those things, right? So that might be, maybe first person might be easier for that, but I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think flashbacks, you can't, well, occasionally people enjoy them, but I, I'm not a great fan of them unless right. everything in the timeline is shifting. So you're never quite sure where you are, but I, I don't do that. Um, um, with, with mine, I think uh, for the two Euphemias, well, for the Euphemia and Hope story, I tell them in the first person. And one of the things that I really love is they're very, very different voices because they're very, very different people. And they also see things in different ways. So it's not that they're unreliable narrators, but it's just that when you're reading it, sometimes you will know much more from what they've observed than they have seen. Um, 
I wrote a fantasy novel recently, um, The Augmenters, and that has so many different factions in it. And that was more of the, you know, the overall uh, God perspective kind of thing, um, because there were so many different things going on. Because, of course, the limitation of going through with one person is you can only ever show the things that they see. So sometimes things come up because they have a conversation and it might be a throwaway comment from another character that said, oh, yes, when, when my brother was younger, he used to lock me in a cupboard. And that that will be what you get. So you'll get that. But you won't, you know, you won't see it or you won't understand all of it. It'll be something that will build up at times. So that's the restriction, I think, from staying in one person's head. But I, I stay in Euphemia's head. Euphemia was incredibly naive about everything. And she ran into Fitzroy. He was not a naive character so there's a lot of misunderstanding and there's a lot of really funny cases in it because what i haven't said is if you write about the sort of darker side of human nature unless you have humor as well it's just too depressed yeah i can understand yeah. that you have to be able to laugh so i tend to stick to for those two novels i stick to first person to really sort of go into them and it's how they're making sense of things as well so there are passages where they will be thinking about other people and they're not they're not like five or six page, uh, pages long or anything like that, but they will be trying to put together how they perceive someone else. And it's actually, I think, more revealing for the writer if they get it wrong, because you're reading it and you think, oh, they've missed that. Um, it, you know, when we're talking about psychology and we're talking about defining characters and everything like that, it is such um, a web, isn't it? You're putting so many things together and somebody says, how do you do this? One, two, three. And it's sort of like, that's really hard. I have to think about my characters. I have to think about what happens. And I have to create all these sort of like balls of twine that I can eventually put together to weave a tapestry. Um, and it's, you know, I, I'm sure it's, in, it's informed by everything I've learned, but it's hard to say exactly how you do it. I wish I could. Um, or do I? Because then everyone would do it. I wouldn't like that. I don't know. I always <laughs> say writers, it's almost like we're radios and we pick up some kind of signal from mm. somewhere and then we just use whatever skills we have in the English language to try and like transcribe the signal. And well, it, it happens with genre, doesn't it? Because we go through yeah. phases when genres are popular. Um, and, you know, when the world is in a, a dire place, we actually, if you look at sales, it's the happiest stuff that sells. So your romance should be doing great, Roman. Oh. Right now. Well, they got quite gritty, gritty and gloomy at the end because you tend to write. Oh, okay. <laughs> but no, because that's bits because uh, well, my my readers they love their tortured male characters, but of course uh, to do that you have to torture them. Yeah, <laughs> well, they get over it. <laughs> exactly. Yes, <laughs> they find love in the end. It's it's. Well, I don't know if it's worth it, but yeah, it's a it's a progression. It's a journey. You're absolutely right. When we were saying earlier about character arcs, if characters don't change and develop, and that's the challenge. If you have a series with like seventeen books, your characters really have to change and have to develop and have to become um, either stronger or weaker. It doesn't really matter which, but they have to be affected by what's happened. And I think that's the other thing about writing something where there are. Um, there's murder or something like that if people aren't affected by it if they're sort of like oh well let's sit down and have a cup of tea and have a chat about this there's something really wrong with them you know we we are you know this is death sudden death um i probably um everybody listening to this will have have lost somebody and then and that's that's very sad but it's that suddenly non-existence of a person whether it's somebody you liked or you didn't like I remember um, when my grandfather died, going to his house and opening the fridge, and there was a Mars bar in the middle of the fridge, and he had been saving his Mars bar, and he never got to eat it. And I felt incredibly sad that he never got his Mars bar, something he was looking forward to, because suddenly it's just, you're gone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. I suppose as writers, we, we leave behind our writing, or we hope people will still read it. Um, yeah, and I, I think uh, I think about that sometimes when I'm watching a, a TV series or reading a book that I'm really into, and I think, oh, if I die before this ends, I, I will, before before I finish this, I won't know how it ends, <laughs> which is obviously a little bit silly, but I'll have other things to worry about. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I mean, I, listen, that happened with uh, the Wheel of Time. Brandon uh, Sanderson mm -hmm. took over for Robert Jordan, who died before he finished the series, and he had to sort of take it on because that was a long running series and you're leaving readers hanging uh by you know by not 
finishing it, right? It's like they'd been reading this series for 20 years or whatever it was. And, and I mean, he, he was dying, so he knew he pulled, he, mm. uh, he chose Sanderson to complete it. He brought him in and talked to him about how he thought it was going to end, you know, but still like, yeah, it's like, if you write a big long series. So for your series, what, for your 17 mm. book series, what perspective is that in? They're both first person. So, um, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, one is, and they're very, very different people. Um, Euphemia is passionate, impulsive, strong sense of justice, but will do what is necessary and can actually be quite cold hearted. Whereas her daughter, um, having been brought up more or less by these really over the top characters, is actually quite quiet. And it's not because she's not thinking, it's because she sits back and observes and tries to stay out of the drama. So, you know, yeah, she's been made the way she is by her upbringing, by her very tempestuous parents. And um, she's very good at observation and evasion. Um, totally the opposite to her mother, who um, learned to punch um, in the same way the suffragettes did. And actually gets mixed up in suffragettes at one point. You know, suffragettes learned jujitsu um, in Britain. That was their, that was their thing. Um, and she's very much a fighter. Her, her mother and that. her daughter is more of a thinker yeah but sometimes you can fight without fighting yes she's very much more mm -hmm. that she's very much more she think about things she manipulate people more she'll make plans that will shift things without with avoiding confrontation whereas her mother was sort of like yeah we're gonna confront them we're gonna deal with this head on so you get yeah and, and i suppose again that's a bit of psychology isn't it because if you're brought up by a really strong loud parent oh god my poor children um you know you turn out a bit different um well and so and manipulation itself is is you know having psychology as a background allows you to manipulate people and thus manipulate your characters and put them in and figure out absolutely the best ways to put them in those positions and, so, and yeah she thinks about um, i mean as, as anyone would if you're trying to manipulate someone you think about what is it they find acceptable and then whatever you want them to do you move it into their acceptable or their needy category so for example if right. somebody said that they would never ever climb a ladder terrified of heights but maybe they love children you know you put a child at the top of a ladder who's in danger <laughs> and they will go straight up the ladder you know you can i mean that's a that's a crass hopefully example. that's what you're doing in your books but not in real life but not yeah. in real life no <laughs> but, but it's a crass example about how you can if you can find the pressure points on people you can make them do things um, if they don't know what's going on. Um, and a lot of the manipulation stuff that's in the World War II books is all about people trying to figure out who's manipulating them and resisting and sort of looking for the truth. Uh, and, so, and, you know, manipulation isn't always... Uh, it has negative connotations, yes. you say it, but you think if you go to the, the chiropractor, he'll manipulate your spine to make it better or uh, things like that. So, you know, manipulation is more of a grey area than always negative. You could say you facilitate people to a different point of view. That sounds very corporate. <laughs> I, I like it, it though. Yeah. Yes. Um, when, when I was a therapist, we always used to say that our main job was to facilitate change. It was never to change anybody, but it was to reflect, reframe, ask questions and to make people think about their worldview and how they felt. So, I mean, that's that's the facilitation. And I think that's part of what we do when we're writing as well. We're inviting people into our worlds and saying, what do you think? Um, and hopefully they leave it entertained at least. And if they lead it with a, with a new idea or some more questions or they think about things more, that's great. Um, that's 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 the gravy love it well you know what that this is actually the perfect time to finish up the psychologist sour uh and uh and start wrapping things up before i ask caroline to tell us mm. where people can find all her books and things craig do you have any final questions uh no but i you know i just want to say this has been really fun for me because it's been so long since i've got to really talk about psychology and some of those things that i learned about in school so long ago um so you know thanks for coming on because i think this really gives people an idea of all the sort of things you you think about to to mm. really bring characters to life and and create those motivations and and um situations and how to get them into those situations situations in the first place by you know manipulating their motivations and you know it's it's so fascinating to me and hopefully it is to uh our listeners as well so thanks again for coming on
it's been really fun. Um, I could talk for hours, but you've probably got that idea anyway. But um, <laughs> yeah, it, it has been really um, enjoyable. Yes. Well, Caroline, I'm, I'm where happy. can people find your books and find out more about you? Um, they can find my books on Amazon and in hopefully any good bookshop. They can find the Euphemia Martin's Mysteries and the Hope Stapleford books. They will find all those books under Caroline Dunford. If they wanted to look for my young adult books, they find them under CJ Dunford to tell the difference. And if they're interested in fantasy, they can know me by an entirely different name, which is a story in itself, which is uh, The Augmentus, which is all about class warfare, among other things. And What's the name? What's the name? The, the, uh, the, the name? Oh, God, yes, the name is Gemini Gibson. Gemini uh, Gibson, that's a good yes, one. Yes, sorry. Absolutely stunning cover. So all my books are Kindles. Um, all of them it should be paperbacks. The, sometimes the earlier ones you can only get in Kindle now, um, but they're around. I am Caroline Dunford at squarespace.com as well. And I was doing Fitzroy's Diary, which was a bit of exposition, I suppose, where he used to put it out every Friday. And there are loads. There's like 189 entries of his thoughts um, on, on things that you can go and look at on uh, on that website. Um, and I will shortly be starting to release some free short stories to entice people into my books. But that's, again, that'll probably be through Amazon. So, well, yeah. That is wonderful. Caroline, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, and yes, if you're listening to this, you can scroll down and we'll find a link to Caroline's work down there. While you're down there, why don't you leave a comment and let Caroline know how much you appreciated the wisdom that she shared with us today. And while you're down there, there's also a subscribe button and a like button, a little bell icon you can click to get notified of every new episode of Fully Booked. And we will be back with a new episode of Fully Booked next week. So until then, cheerio.